a cricketing view, an irregular podcast about cricket and other things. Episode 7. In this episode, I speak to Snehal Pradhan. Snehal is a former India fast bowler and current YouTuber, commentator and writer on cricket. We discuss the landscape of women's cricket. Welcome, Snehal. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So, you you played for India. You also played for Maharashtra, which is unfortunate. But I suppose, you know, given that it got you to play for India, I suppose there's something redeeming about it. Uh, how, do, how did that happen? How did it, how did it come about? Um, I think it seriously uh, crystallized when I saw Julan Goswami bowl for the first time. I was always into sports. I was fairly athletically built as a pre-teen and as a teenager, um, almost six feet tall, always the tallest, even amongst the boys in my class. So I was inclined to pretty much all sports. I tried out pretty much every sport in school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when I say pretty much every, there was not a lot of sports as compared to places uh, like the US, but everything, tennis, badminton, table tennis, little bit of football. Yeah. And, yeah. But cricket, cricket was always my favorite, probably just because there was so much cricket around. Um, yeah. That That is what I wanted to do. To, uh, that is what I enjoyed most. And uh, then I got introduced to the local cricketing, women's cricket scene in Pune. And I, then I saw Julan Goswami bowl for the first time on TV uh, in her debut series when she was a 19-year-old. I was a 16-year-old, which is probably 2001 or two. And that's when, that's when the dream really took hold that I want to open the bowling for India. And luckily I was privileged enough to be able to continue sport fairly easily. My family was extremely supportive. Uh, even though women's cricket wasn't earning, I was, wasn't was uh, in any ways giving me any kind of uh, monetary benefit. I was able to pursue the game until my graduation, no questions asked. Uh, after my graduation, I was able to take up a job in um, Western Railway. So that's a sports quota uh, government job. Yeah. which then allowed me to pursue it further. And then that's essentially a stepping stone for me to be able to take it pretty much full time. And I did that for another nine years after that and finally retired in 2015. Wow. So you, you already had one career and you retired from it. Now you're starting a second one. Yes. And that, that discovering is a remarkable that. thing. Thank you. I'm discovering that everyone's gotten a 10 year head start. Yeah, but you've got like experience that everyone doesn't have. Yes. When, absolutely. And you play for India, which basically in my book, it makes you like, you know, a class apart from everybody else. Yeah, yeah. that I uh, mean, that definitely helped in uh, the second phase of my life. What was the favorite format when you were growing up? Because this is an open question right now. And you know, I want to develop this question a little further. When you thought cricket, did you think white ball or did you think test match? Um, more than white ball, I thought 50 overs because okay. that's the format I grew up playing. Right. Um, I mean, T20 only came around uh, 2005-06. Correct. Um, and for women's cricket, we didn't have multi-day cricket. When I was playing, we had some in the 90s, but yeah. Uh, yeah. in my playing days, we only had 50 over format for under 16s. We played 25 over games. Yeah. So, so I, I always identified uh, cricket with 50 over cricket, which we, we of course played with uh, whites and a red ball in yeah. uh, domestic yeah. cricket. Uh, but when T20 cricket came along, I really enjoyed that format. I love the short and sharp nature of the game. As a player, I enjoyed the challenge of having uh, a batter who's going after me and the fact that even a dot ball is a win. Yeah. Uh, I also liked the different roles it allowed me to play because in D20 cricket for my state, I sometimes opened the batting, sometimes uh, essentially was used like a pinch hitter in the first six overs. 
I loved the challenge wow. of uh, fielding uh, in the deep when I know that uh, every ball is most likely going to be hit there very hard, and I have to cut off the boundary or the second. So that slightly more intense version of cricket is probably the format I enjoyed more. We only played multi-day cricket for a season, or was it two? I think maximum two seasons. Yeah. And yeah. and I and I realized that especially as a fast bowler, having to you know suddenly go from bowling maximum ten overs a day to sometimes bowling twenty plus overs a day, yeah. uh, it requires a whole different level of physical preparation, mental preparation, and yeah. skills and executions. So it was only in my last couple of seasons that uh, I played. In my one of the uh, very first seasons when the BCCI took over cricket, that's around two thousand six seven, mm. and in my one of my last seasons in twenty fourteen fifteen, where we actually played multi day cricket. As mm. a viewer, I also enjoy watching short format cricket more than I enjoy uh, watching long format cricket, but I enjoy following Test cricket um, probably more than. Um, a short format game because of course there's so much more scope for more narratives in a test match women's cricket had its own uh, administrators uh, for decades in india and then in the early 21st century bcci took it over and coincidentally since then india have not played a lot of test cricket you know and actually nobody is playing a lot of test cricket you know it's only in the ashes that you had you know test one test match Every 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 Ashes. Uh, the yeah. last time India played a Test match was what 2015-16 that season. And South Africa came in that the last Test match India played. Is that is that a coincidence or did the, the do you think that you know BCCI's involvement has created this uh, shift in focus to white ball both at the in the Indian level and also increasingly at the ICC's level. I think they are towing uh, the unofficial ICC line. Yeah. That uh, limited overs cricket, especially T20s, is the best format to grow the game. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's probably something that if they wanted to do, they can do. Yeah. And I think when in that 2015 Test match, when Anurag Thakur was uh, the BCCI president, and he took a number of very proactive decisions for women's cricket, like the introduction of women's contracts for the first time, giving permission for uh, Indian players to play in foreign T20 leagues, and yeah. holding that Test match. So it shows what you can do when you have an administrator who has the will. to just do it i mean money isn't an isn't a question for the bcci no so at least hosting a test match every time a team comes over for a limited over series should not be a problem yeah it it, it shouldn't and you know we we think about everything in terms of you know immediate returns nowadays but you know we forget that for a number of the decade, decades before you know you had five or six good test teams you really only had two or three good test teams even in the men's game and mm. you know it was not a it was a it was a game which grow has grown and which is gotten where it is today because a lot of people you know arranged games and hosted teams and sent teams without really making millions of rupees or dollars out of it and now the bcci has not only it does it have the means but it also has it has a growing player base right i mean the women's player base is growing in india significant at a significant speed right yes but like the example you mentioned previously i mean it existed in an era where uh, the other formats weren't really eating into or the other formats weren't competing with test cricket as much Correct. and having right. having a couple of formats now which offer uh, more immediate returns yeah is yeah. is a factor but it's not it's a factor for other boards and i can completely understand why new zealand cricket for example have an official policy to not play test matches yeah um for women but uh, other that that's that's a factor for other boards but there's really nothing stopping the bcci 
from playing test matches and they are the ones who need to take the lead essentially they make the weather in cricket now isn't it yeah what is the landscape of women's cricket in india like today compared to when you were let's say you know making your way into the maharashtra side you know i mean I, i my 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 sense of women's cricket has always been that the railways were like the the bombay of the women's game mm. you know, in a sense uh, that's mm. no longer true isn't it well actually um, so before in when i started playing 2000 to 2005 pre bcci yeah i'd say that domestic cricket was in pretty good health because we had two very strong teams on the domestic circuit uh the railways and air india and yeah. essentially all the talent sooner or later on short term contracts with air india and on long term jobs with railways moved yeah. into those yeah. two teams and then you had the odd challenger here and there but because we had two teams yeah. uh yeah. we had essentially a pool of 20 players who were exposed to high level domestic cricket competitive domestic cricket mm. and it coincided with probably india's best run um, in international cricket where they reached the final of the 2005 world cup post bcci that's 2005 6 when the bcci came in the right. air india team had to shut down because yeah. uh, they didn't have a corresponding place in men's cricket so only the teams which played in men's cricket could also play in women's cricket railways remained yeah and yeah. therefore they absorbed a lot of the talent that air india let go of yeah and for about 10 years they were almost undefeated i think if i remember correctly they lost two finals in 10 years wow um and just every year they were sweeping all tournaments and again that corresponded with a period where uh india didn't really do well internationally um there was always potential so the a third place finish in the 2009 world cup but then a bad finish in the 2013 world cup yeah again corresponding with not so many things i mean those were also the srinivasan years so women's cricket wasn't treated well after the initial impetus under sharad pawar yeah but now we see a little bit of a shift because of uh, in part the bcci central contracts so because the bcci is centrally contracting players younger players who earn contracts don't feel the need to go to a railways to earn their money to have job security to allow uh, women's cricket to become their career and therefore there is a shift we saw bengal beating railways for yeah. the first time and uh, taking the domestic title last year again one trend we're seeing now in women's cricket is professionals playing from other states deepthi sharma who is from agra plays played from uttar pradesh switched to bengal and helped them uh, win their first ever title yeah with the introduction of uh, so many new teams this year we're again seeing that trend of professionals that players who think they weren't getting exposure from their own domestic teams shifting to the smaller teams like the sikkims and the pondicherries yeah so so there is a well established senior level domestic structure in india yeah. in t20 yeah. and 50 over format yeah but there is not a well established uh, structure below that because then it essentially depends on the whims and fancies of the state associations and some state associations are really proactive when it comes to women's cricket and some are absolutely uh, they're really shamelessly bad at it that was what i was wondering about because you know bcci will give uh, central contracts to like the top players right but where do these players compete in order to improve themselves you know you know what is happening at the level below that you know because in the men's side the the bay the bottom at the bottom of it all are clubs you know uh, like the, the club scene in bombay has been around for a long time and you know the club scene in bangalore and the club scene in madras and all those places and in you know, in in the women's game there hasn't been that much widespread you know corporate support 
uh, you know had in, in any which is in any sense comparable to what the men enjoyed isn't it yeah so one of the things i have always uh, written about is that the bcci essentially need to introduce a corporate trophy uh, yeah. like they have yeah. in the in men's cricket yeah. and that will allow teams like air india and the other psus yeah. give them a tournament to field uh, a team in so it might just be one other psu or one other team that employs cricketers at first yeah but that will also help uh, nullify a little bit of the dominance that railways has in domestic cricket because then other companies will also start giving jobs to uh, young cricketers and therefore you will have much more balance in uh, domestic cricket there are yeah, complications but- to that so many psus are struggling right now and probably won't hire uh, any sports people but uh, in theory that is something that could be done Yeah, but I mean, it's not just the PSUs, right? Even the uh, even the private companies, which are you know like Tata's and Mafatlal and all those companies, they used to support uh, you know lo- local cricket uh, local cricket teams uh, in the in on the men's side, you know. Yeah. And as the women's game grows, I can see completely a uh, you know an advantage for companies which otherwise. you know their customer base is the family their main product is aimed at everyday family life for them having like a a star woman woman cricketer on their payroll and you know having her lead their team and you know the kind of publicity that will give them is easily easily a good investment isn't it yeah so there is is an opportunity for someone to disrupt things but yeah. i i do get that they need a bcci approved tournament to yeah. field that in in so uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation yeah but uh, it's a it's essentially a discussion that needs to happen between one of these entities and the bcci saying that okay we'll employ the players you give us the tournament and let's get this thing going because despite having a well established senior domestic structure there isn't a well established under 16 feeder system and yeah. that's one of my biggest complaints that we still don't have a national under 16 tournament which is something that we even had under the women's cricket association of india who didn't yeah. have even a percentage of uh, the bcci's resources there's so much talk right now that you know they have a new constitution and you know saurav ganguly is uh, ex player and he he can see things in a way which you know the owner of a cement company maybe won't you know this is this is the theory doing the rounds mm. you know and you know so a, a lot of that stuff is sort of low hanging fruit that's been talked about you know better money for ranji trophy men's ranji trophy players and you know overhauling the national cricket academy and all that sort of uh, aimed at helping the next shubman gill and people of that kind whereas i think the women's side there's a bigger opportunity to do something you know lasting and big that will sort of and and it is going to need to be something which is designed to work over maybe a generation no it's not it's not something which is going to be up and fully formed like next year if they start it now yeah and the opportunity is so big that yeah. uh, yeah. like people are talking about cricket in uh, the olympic games by the time 2028 comes around yeah and just yeah. like women's uh, sports otherwise sometimes just purely because of participation numbers it's easier to win a medal in women's sport than it is in men's sport yeah so cricket presents an opportunity for india to be double olympic gold medalists in 10 years time yeah and it's a it, i mean apart from what you can win you know it it's a it's a social good no it's a public good you know because if there's a if if the bcci backs this other people will back it too you know i mean the 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 bcci's great advantage on the men's side is that it's not a top down thing right it's a there are local clubs and then local associations and it's a member board 
and and it has to create and and that's why it works isn't it i mean it's not it 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 works because it the the bosses have to operate with the consent of the members they have to keep satisfy what the members want and the that that sort of depth has to be cultivated no it's not just going to pop up one day it has to be done with an eye on what things will look like in say 2040 isn't it yeah yeah and i mean you're talking about the social good yeah. because women's cricket has um, a level of semi professionalism still you yeah. see some really amazing stories of life transformation uh, mm-hmm. in women's cricket there's um, i mean our kalpana um, from andhra pradesh yeah. the daughter of a uh, rickshaw driver who yeah. was about to be married off her coach basically convinced her parents to not uh, do that and allow her to play cricket she went on to uh, represent india uh, whereas you know if she wasn't playing cricket she would just be cooking someone's food and not yeah. be socially significant it seems to me that it's a no brainer i mean it's a, it's a it's an opportunity that's begging to be exploited you know somebody at the bcci is Some, some some somebody needs to make like a big think about it as to why they're not doing it yeah okay fine it will not it will not earn them money next year or in the next 5 years but if if the other half of the population starts playing cricket with anything like the enthusiasm of what the boys have been playing you know and anything like the in anything like the numbers in which the boys are playing then you know in, then india will be unbeatable yeah and you know bcci i will have a whole second revenue stream because you know you know sadly that's what seems to make them happy <laughs> nowadays yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's only it's only after 2017 when uh, the women got to the final of the world cup that i think the bcci has woken up to the potential of uh, of actually earning revenue in the long term from women's cricket and it's something that as cricketers we used to discuss that you know <laughs> julan goswami likes to put it as indians believe in dhamaka yeah so yeah. when when <laughs> when you win something big that's when people will pay attention yeah and uh, hopefully and unfortunately that's the way it is but even my my complaint is that even after 2017 things are not changing fast enough of course the the entire administration has been in limbo essentially for the last couple of years and nothing has really happened coa was only temporary thing so all they did was maintain 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 they didn't yeah. do anything new there's there's huge opportunity now especially i mean uh, with ganguly in charge yeah even though yeah. very little of the conversation has been around women's cricket i have uh, seen and heard very good things done when he uh, was in bengal Uh, yeah with us julan goswami also being there um, yeah so hoping for uh, more uh, action for on the women's cricket front as well yeah and even on the administration side they now have uh, tnca has a woman president who's fine she's from a very established cricket family there uh, but nevertheless I mean I think I do believe that new kinds of eyes produce new kinds of ideas you know so I I I think all sorts of all these expansions are extremely valuable you know I look at your uh, uh, YouTube channel for instance which is mm-hmm. a tre- tremendous success I think and I I enjoy it thanks whenever I get a chance to see something new I see your training uh, I see your you know tips videos and I see your you know commentary videos and they are a lot of fun to listen to thank you, know, you. those i mean apart from sort of being successful for you i think they are also they have they have broader significance beyond just traffic and all that yeah i mean i i also probably realized this belatedly for me it was just you know yeah the fact that i'm starting a youtube channel but yeah. uh, in the 2018 t20 world cup uh, in the west indies i was yeah. chatting with lisa stalekar and she was yeah. just pointing out to me that you know it's amazing to have a female role model uh, teaching young kids cricket and 
probably 85% of my audience are boys yeah for them it's probably a new um, experience to see a woman teaching them cricket and this is something that i probably didn't think about before but yeah i mean i can see what you're saying that there are so many repercussions of um, this visibility not just through youtube but through journalism the fact that there's a regular column in the newspaper about women's cricket written by a female um yeah. former yeah. cricketer I, yeah sometimes i do reflect on these things and think that yeah they are significant i mean i i i am really quite proud of the um small contributions i made to the coverage of women's cricket in india when i quit playing there wasn't a lot there weren't a lot of people writing on women's cricket traveling to cover their games for the women's world cup 2017 there were just the three of us from india yeah, that and that's ridiculous and, isn't it yeah i mean that's unthinkable <laughs> now three people can you imagine that probably three people from one publication who went to the 2019 world cup just now <laughs> isn't it yep <laughs> watching cricket coverage it has been in a just a really awful situation the female presence on the broadcast you know has only recently been a cricketing presence isn't it yeah and because previously it was a celebrity presence and i used to always wonder you know when they had like mandira bedi or whoever and i would say well they would never have a male television actor on the cricket broadcast yeah, yeah. And, and and it's a, just a it always struck me as being really odd and you know there have been controversies uh, on this you know where there was the chris gale situation in the bbl like which you know cricket australia made a lot of noise but actually didn't do a lot and it's not as though there aren't women cricketers who could commentate on the game as well as the men cricketers you know i mean it, there are there are you know dozens of such who are who could do the job that i think that's another area where you know there needs to be a breakthrough in india there has been some beginnings in england and australia but not yet in india apparently yeah i mean anjum anjum chopra has been doing a fantastic job yeah. for so many years of uh, you know being the face of women's cricket in the commentary box uh, after her playing career and um and slowly it's it's shifting i mean uh, i've i've been lucky enough to get a few opportunities to discuss uh, the game for uh, big broadcast platforms yeah, yeah. Uh, so there is um, a change coming i mean uh, a lot of people talk about mandira bedi as one of the um, almost villains of uh, this story but um, i mean there's there's an, there's an almost another side to it the fact that you had a female even a celebrity but a female on that yeah. broadcast yeah. just opened people's eyes to the fact that yes women also do talk about cricket um, and behind the scenes uh, there's a story lovely story in um, the fantastic book the fire burns blue which uh, yeah. karunya keshav yeah. and siddhant patnaik who passed away this year the yeah. two of them authored where um, at a time when the women's cricket association of india needed funds mandira bedi actually provided some funds i don't for a moment think that she's the villain of this story i i, mm. i think i think she reflects a male attitude towards the story which yeah has to is even back then it seemed to me was just horribly outdated the the women's broadcast is of course excellent you know and ex women women players get an opportunity on it but i remember when i was small in school uh, there used to be india games and uh, um, men's india games you know and i remember distinctly listening to diana adolji on commentary on those games that, and that was back in the day when durdarshan was involved okay and that is and it's now 2019 and there still isn't a regular uh, female voice or regular female voices doing india men's games because that that's the big opportunity right that's where the the if, if the women's game has to grow those are the that's the place where the voices will be amplified you know like like nobody's business isn't it 
Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's you get the feeling that um, there is a second wave of females in the press box waiting yes. to come into the press box, waiting to come into the commentary boxes, yeah. waiting to come out on uh, platforms like YouTube. I mean, yeah. I. Met I met a young lady who was uh, the media liaison of the South Africa women's team. Yeah. Who told me that uh, she was just a cricketer who started putting out uh, review videos on YouTube. Someone at Cricket South Africa picked that up and she got some media work there and now she's traveling to India um, yeah. representing her country essentially in the media department. So there is that in the next 10 years we're going to see a change yeah, yeah. and yeah. there will also be bumps along that uh, road of a change there will also be uh, jostling for places i mean yeah. uh, kas naidu was down here covering the south africa series and she was telling me that sometimes there's only place for one woman and there yeah. are many yeah. more women who are ready to compete essentially very interesting yeah. time it's a very interesting time and you know i use twitter occasionally to get into fights with people and things like that <laughs> <laughs> occasionally and, yeah occasionally um, <laughs> in any discussion of women's cricket there's always a certain percentage and there's always men who say compared to the men's game it's very slow and boring and this refusal of people to distinguish between the concept of two things being the same and two things being equal it really really drives me up the wall you know for instance nobody none of these men say that you know pv sindhu is not as good a badminton player as the men's champion but in cricket this seems to sort of exist a lot more is that because cricket is more popular and it is reaching a different part of the population compared to say badminton or is it some something else i think it's a it's a combination of uh, a few factors one is that we're just used to watching so much more men's cricket than women's cricket that the difference between men's and women's cricket uh, comes across very clearly uh, and therefore our frame of reference for uh, the lay viewer is often uh, men's cricket which is why they always use that to compare it to women's cricket second thing is that unlike a sport like badminton where yeah. visually there isn't a huge yeah. difference between men's and women's badminton i mean a, a skilled viewer can obviously tell there are differences but yeah. a women's badminton yeah. game is still very fast paced whereas yeah. there is a clear visual difference between the fastest or the average women's bowler uh, fast bowler and the average men's fast bowler so there is that visual difference which you need to make a mental adjustment to account for yeah um, track and field you can't see the difference between um, a women's 100 meter and a men's 100 meter as starkly as you can see the difference between um, just the power hitting element of how it used to be in the women's game and how it used to be in the men's game now of course those elements are catching up pretty fast yeah i mean you yeah. look at you look at like harmanpreet kaur or you know smriti mandhana or you know elise perry especially and the comparison is futile but they are outstanding players the eye the footwork the the ability to meet the ball you know these are all i mean if you if you can appreciate you know kohli or smith you should if you are a cricket fan be able to appreciate harmanpreet kaur or elise perry or any of these you know top top players yeah so if you look closely enough you yeah. see so many things that uh, you will that yes are different but if you're a cricket fan you will stay for i mean the mithali raj cover drive yeah if you can't appreciate that then are you there for the cricket or are you there just uh, for the cheerleaders is what i'll ask it's a different game but it's still really really hard to be as good as mithali raj or any of these you know national players isn't it yeah so i think it's just a matter of uh, exposure i think it's just a matter of having those conversations which will help change mindsets and it's it's women's cricket is in that transition phase not just in india but all across the world where you are struggling not just to be seen but also to be understood it's a different game it occurs at a different pace 
I think spin bowling seems to play a different role in the women's game compared to the men's game. Is, mm, is, that, is that, do you want to sort of expand on that a little bit? That's probably down to the fact that in the men's game, even uh, with a wild slog, which you don't connect, you'll probably clear mid off and mid on yeah. very easily. Yeah. Uh, which is not true of most female cricketers. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, your spinners become an attacking option with often operating with your mid on mid off up. Yeah. And you have the likes of Poonam Yadav, who is just a shade under five feet tall, but floats the ball over the uh, six and a half feet line. Yeah. yeah. So that's a unique style of bowling which you will never see in men's cricket. And yeah, well, I think it's one of the great, great joys of uh, the game. I mean, some people don't like her. Some people call it too slow and some people call it unattractive cricket. But uh, I mean, having played against her, she is extremely hard to score off. And it's yeah. an yeah. athletic challenge. Well, your, your Maharashtra compatriot, Kedar Jadav, is an exponent of that, yeah. that style. But, but, he, but his action is nothing like Poonam Yadav. Yeah. Action. His action is awful. And no, I, I love it. I love Kedar Zadha's action. I love the fact that he confounds so many batters who think they should be able to hit him easily and they can't. And that's exactly what uh, international cricket discovered with Poonam Yadav. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, these are the almost freaks that uh, make the game so much more fun to watch. If you really, really uh, notice, yeah. watch the ball in her palm and you yeah. notice how big the ball looks in her palm. And this is a women's ball, which is five ounces, not five and a half ounces like the men's ball, slightly smaller. Yeah. But her palm is just so small. And yeah. still, she's yeah. one of the best spinners in the world, a leg spinner. That too. I do want to ask you about an experience you've been through which is the experience of being called for a for an action and then having to go through the ICC's you know remedial process and clearing it you know mm. and in your in your case it happened very quickly right it happened within a matter of months what was that process like um the ICC process you mean yeah i mean uh, i've spoken this spoken about this uh, before on subhash's podcast as well yeah. and i think one of the things i didn't mention there is that yeah. i felt pretty angry that yeah. uh, one of the first times women's cricket is in the news is yeah. because of this i mean that was a phase where women's cricket really didn't make the news but yeah. uh, when something wrong in air quotes happened yeah. Uh, uh, immediately, you know, it's um, the center of attention. Is it really something wrong, though? I mean, it's just a technical exactly. problem, right? I mean, it's exactly. A, so it's not a moral that, problem. It's a, it's a, that's the second thing I was quite angry about, in the sense that it was there were suggestions. Almost the impression I got that uh, it was suggested to be almost uh, almost like cheating in India, where we say. Fakey takto hai, fakey takti hai. We say in Marathi, yeah, as if it's very, uh, it's an immoral thing. And for me, it was um, essentially a phase where I was in between coaches and with technique not in uh, the place that I should have been. Uh, it was again a marginal uh, call. I think the ICC testing showed an average of uh, 17 degrees where. Uh, the permitted angle is around 15 degrees. Yeah. And yeah. then it, it did set my career back, obviously. I didn't play for India after that, although I did uh, play high-level cricket. My last game was for India A. So, yeah. yes, I look at that entire period with the... If I, had, if I could go back, I would do a lot of things differently. But at the same time, I see... Uh, I do remember feeling... A little, I feeling the that shame, that feeling of anger, uh, and also feeling pretty proud of myself for coming back from it uh, and always staying in contention for a spot in the national team since then. Where do you see the international women's game? Because one of the things that's happened, 
at the ICC level is that they've basically said, it seems to me, that as far as the women's game is concerned, T20 is the prime format. Mm. You know, for and and they've generally said more broadly that as far as growing the game is concerned, T20 is the prime format. And so they've awarded every association basically T20 international status, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about that? I'm happy about it. Uh, and I'd like to see that extended to other formats and yeah. eventually men's cricket as well. Because uh, there's a lot of uh, bruha about how that will affect stats and how... Yeah. Uh, we won't be able to really determine use stats the same way. But I mean, just apply filters. If you're playing for your state, those matches aren't counted as official matches, official interstate matches. Yeah. Uh, it can really remove a little bit of meaning from those matches. Yeah. So yeah. The, the fact that these countries like the Hong Kongs and the Singapores and the Thailands who have now qualified for Australia, yeah. they are... They know that, you know, those matches count. It yeah. makes a difference. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Do you do you buy the idea that T20 is like a gateway format for the other formats? Uh, in men's cricket or in women's cricket? Uh, let's start with women's cricket. In women's cricket, yes. Hmm. Because um, what, there is a lot of overlap between the 50 over format and the T20 format. Yeah. So, yes, if you are introduced to women's cricket through a T20 game, yeah, especially in India, fans will gravitate towards a certain player. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they will want to see that certain player playing irrespective of the format. Right. right. So, that is something that is um, definitely will lead people into other formats of the game. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people right now who might be watching this stream uh, yeah. who are yeah. simply watching it because they are Harman Kaur fans. Yeah. yeah. And that's how fandom works in India. That's how cricket works in India. That it's all about the stars. It's all about your favorite players. And if you have that favorite player, you will watch them in any um, situation, even in the middle of the night as it is in India right now. That's so true because, you know, in the recent India-South Africa series, you know, I didn't watch most of it, but I, I did sort of have the score on at one point uh, on in one window. Mm. And, uh, you know, when Rabada was bowling, I would sort of switch it on and watch it for a little while. It's just because I want to watch Rabada. And, and nowadays uh, with all these new broadcasting platforms, that just, that does become a realistic possibility right you can actually do it if you want to yeah and t20 le lends itself to uh, a little bit of instant drama that then uh, fixes the star in the minds of a viewer and yeah. then hopefully the viewer follows the star into whichever format she goes so yeah I, for women's cricket i think definitely t20 uh, is a gateway format i do want to ask you about elise perry she's extraordinary isn't she she's she's like even further ahead of the next best women player than Steve Smith is of the next best men's test batsman, isn't it, at the moment? Probably. I mean, it just looks like that. And it's astounding how she can do that, not just with one skill, but with two. Both skills, so, yeah. And even, I'm, even with her fielding. Yeah. And she's probably going to be the archetype of the fitness expectations from women's cricketers for the next generation. Well, I remember yeah. just uh, my one of my mentors showing me a video while I was playing of yeah. her doing pull-ups and she was just doing six, seven, eight pull-ups with ease. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'll bet you that most female cricketers, probably 80% of female cricketers, maybe even 50% of international cricketers yeah. won't yeah. be able uh, to do that right now. Because it's just a cultural thing where the training culture, the professional culture hasn't been around long enough for that to yeah. become the normal. She bats in the top four and she takes the new ball. You know, she's, uh, she's like sober. Increasingly, I, my 
cricket watching happens when you know some player I like is on because I no longer really care about results. You know, so yeah, I do. I, she is one of the players I watch. You know, yeah. if, if I see a cricket for scorecard and she's playing, and if I can find a video, then I do. I do watch it. What do you think the relationship of the women's IPL should be to the men's IPL? Because this is a question which uh, the Australians have, you know, tried to answer in several ways. Hmm. I think there needs to be uh, the same franchises in a women's IPL as there are in men's IPL. Yeah, because right That's now they are completely different. No, supernova is velocity and what is the third one? Right Trail now they just they just placeholders. They just placeholder yeah. teams. Yeah. Um, just you know, someone come up with three interesting names and given them colors and. But there's no entities uh, lasting beyond that women's IPL. Yeah. But for the success of, I mean, I, I was just reading up on uh, the WNBA and the NBA. Yeah. Um, and how they have had different teams. Yes. Uh, for so long. Yeah. Um, and comparing it to just forget WBBL. I mean, even AFL women. Yeah. Where they've also started a team with the same franchises, the same clubs have started out women's teams, existing clubs have uh, opened up women's teams. Yeah. And just that brand integration, the crossover, loyalty for the fans, and yeah. the identification yeah. is invaluable, irreplaceable. You have a 10 year established brand in the IPL and 10 year established brand in each franchises. And if you don't find a way to bring women's teams on board for that, it yeah. is uh, the biggest lost opportunity. It shouldn't take that much of an imagination or, you know, even investment to incentivize, say, you know, Mumbai Indians and you know, at least four or five of the franchises to also create a women's T20 side, right? To go alongside the men's T20 sides and play the tournament. The way I see it is that there are already, uh, from whatever feelers I have, there are already four teams who are willing to uh, take on Start. women's teams. Oh, excellent. And uh, that's something that is what you need to start things off with. Yeah. And incentivize is the right word you use that first at for the first five years, I think this is something that needs to be bankrolled by the BCCI. So I think for the next two years, we're going to see an expansion of this current ad hoc tournament. Yeah. Uh, and then we might see a situation where they'll take a decision as to whether to go with um, the same franchises or whether to bring in different brands, different owners, different properties. But I'll be very, I'll be very disappointed if we don't have a Kolkata Knight Riders IPL team with Julian Goswami steaming in. To miss that opportunity would be just crazy. Because right now it seems to me that these three teams are basically right, like India, red, green and what? Yeah, blue. exactly. But with a couple of foreign players like, you know, Natalie exactly. Scriver and Jahan Arala, Alam and, uh, you know, Daniel Wyatt and all these people. Right? Exactly. There isn't a franchise backing any of these teams right now. No, no. It's it's an exhibition tournament right now. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. It's it's not even called a women's IPL. It's IPL T20 Women's Challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So, which is fair enough. Use this as a starting point. I mean, Kabaddi has done that. Yeah. Um, to use exhibition women's games in the middle of the Pro Kabaddi League. Yeah. Um, so, fair enough, start here, but expand it in a way that uh, we have congruence between uh, the current IPL and the women's IPL, which goes ahead in future. And I think I think that in 10 years, a women's IPL will be a standalone tournament. It's a ready-made bridge that is available to them right now. And, and they, they would be... It, it, just, it just comes down to a few franchises which will be hesitant. It just depends on a demonstration of financial success, yeah, which will change their minds, is what I think. I, I really hope it starts. You you remember the whole story of the mixed gender exhibition match, right? It it will be interesting mm. because I mean we've played, or every women's cricketer has played a mixed gender cricket match because most of us grew up playing with the boys. Yeah, but again because like I said, the differences between 
men's and women's cricket are quite visible uh, it needs to be done uh, intelligently yeah i agree because it sort of risks playing into all these stereotypes which we just talked about some few minutes back isn't yeah. it you know and and you we all you already seen this you know with uh, you know the way the you know chuck day india that film was framed that you remember it had that scene of you know the women's team having to compete with the play an exhibition game against the men's team uh, yeah. you know to satisfy the administration that you know it was worth investing in this is completely crazy and they showed it like some achievement by the women's team which it was but they should never have been put into that position in the first place yeah so the how we used to do it was always to match the physical um, standards as much as possible so senior level girls me as a 21 23 year old would be playing in an under 16 team yeah and and that worked really well but this is not that this is the senior players it has potential even just for highlights value i mean yeah if you have yuzvendra chahal being hit for six by harmanpreet kaur yeah i mean that's that's essentially all you need from that endeavor my fear about this game is that it it will just set off all the the worst kind of stereotypes once the question starts coming you know there will be all kinds of well meaning articles and commentary about which sort of meets these questions halfway and that's not a good place for the for the game i think it's not a good place for the men's game and it's not a good place for the women's game so i i i have to confess i have misgivings about this mixed gender game i think i think it's going to be very well stage managed it's not going to be a live game uh, i'm pretty sure they're going to package it because finally it is a product oh you mean they won't show it live i don't think so oh hmm. cuz i thought it would be like any other exhibition match you know yeah that's true. yeah but uh, it's very possible that they might they just might make a almost like a documentary uh, out of it on the one hand people will see like the senior men's players not playing to their full level and that's not good and on the other hand they might see the women players being overmatched and that's not good either and and actually it's not even relevant so. it's but it's it it has potential which is why i think it should be done because yeah. even now yeah. um yeah. people talk about that exhibition match in the 90s in australia where yeah. zoe yeah. goss got brian lara out ah okay so i mean just for sheer talking point value yeah it might be something worth just trying out yeah. in a in an intelligent way maybe in a in a very safe environment to yeah make sure you mitigate whatever risks there are but yeah it's again something that sometimes you need like you said new eyes to see new things that yeah. most people in the system will advise against it but then you need that crazy marketing person maybe to suggest something new well on that hopeful note uh snehal thank you very much i enjoyed this conversation very much i hope it's providing our listeners with a useful picture of where the women's game is and where it's where the where it has come from and where it might go uh, i encourage all listeners to visit snehal's uh youtube channel and also read her essays and reports they're very easy to find and they are wonderful please listen watch and read snehal's work uh thank you my pleasure